Um, when I was here last, what we talked about was uh, when biomechanics matters. It was sort of reconciling that idea that no one actually says the bio is unimportant. That's sort of a straw man out there. But today, we're actually going to have some fun. Maybe. I don't know. It's up to you. Um, I always say, because with my course, we want people talking and engaging. So when the course sucks, it's your fault, because you didn't bring anything to the table. Uh, and that's exactly what this, course, uh, this uh, lecture is. That's why it's the Choose Your Own Adventure. So we're going to set a framework uh, uh, talking about when biomechanics doesn't matter. Right? And we're going to sort of go through. So you can pull out your phones, you know, get your PubMed on there. And what we're going to do is pull out sort of different biomechanical ideas that people have used to explain pain that are quite prevalent. And then what we're going to try to do with the big brains that we have in the room is just poke them apart with the research that we have off the top of our head. right? Because what I often say is it's not the pain science or the neuroscience that challenges these biomechanical ideas. It's the biomechanics itself. Right? And if you know the biomechanics well, you can really see the holes in the, in the common arguments. Like an example would be, we can do this little exercise. We're all sitting. And you, if you've read the biomechanical literature, you know it's like the worst thing you can possibly do for your frail spine. It's like the new smoking. I would even say it's like sitting on a thousand burning cigarettes. That's how dangerous it is. It's worse than a new smoking. It's smoking out of both ends. It's horrible. You don't want to do it. It's sitting. So what you need to do to protect your fragile core, and remember, most of you are one quick bend away from your spine exploding. I would say half of, in you, half of, half of you here are degenerative. You've got spurs. You know, you've got fraying. It's pretty disgusting. So what I need you to do is protect your cores right now. So everyone activate, you know, your external oblique first, then your internal obliques. Make sure it slides properly with the interlayer sliding over the transverse abdominis. And now I need you to turn your glutes on. Okay, go ahead, everyone. Pucker up. Right? Wait a minute. Did you smell it? Some of you turned your hamstrings on first. You deviant bastards. Okay. And you call yourselves movement professionals, and you can't turn on your goddamn glutes before your freaking hamstrings. It disgusts me. And then you're like, why are, you, why are you laughing like that? What is this? This is a 42 pound fucking head, and what are you doing to your neck? If you're gonna laugh, get in neutral. That's a lot. And think of all the compression on your spine when you're laughing. It engages the whole core. Your intra-abdominal pressure is through the roof. And if you don't activate your diaphragm, then really fuck, because then you're breathing through your scalenes. Everyone know, don't laugh through your scalenes. Get your phrenic nerve turned on, and boom, laugh away. It's a proper way to use your body. If you don't do it, don't use it. Oh, God. <laughs> I gotta write this stuff out. It's like I did a video once called The Layman Initiative. And it was just, I had my daughter, my wife's like, I leave the house for half an hour, and our three year old is like in her underwear on the internet. <laughs> like, I had props, I got three kids, gotta use them for something. Because they're useless. All right. So, if you look at the biomechanical literature, what we often do is we find dysfunctions, right? That's what we always do. That's what biomechanists do. That's what I did for a long time. And typically, you do a study uh, where you have one group of people who have pain and the other group that don't, right? And then you sort of say, what's the difference between the two, right? Classic studies, that's what we do. And then how do you determine what you're going to measure? Some of you know this. How are you going to determine how is the group with pain different from the group who does not have pain? You look around your lab and you see what equipment you have. <laughs> and if you want to do a follow-up study, you ask for grants to get more equipment. And what are you going to find? You think people who have pain are going to be different in some biomechanical variable than someone who doesn't have pain? Yeah. Can you think how many, bio, uh, how many dysfunctions there are, or dysfunctions there are in people that have pain? 50? 100? We're just limited by our equipment. And so, Ah, uh, click. Uh-oh. Oh, this is dysfunctional because you have to turn it on. All right. You know, so there's a ton. You know, we talk about muscle timing changes, muscle tightness, range of motion, weakness, stability, EMG changes, joint kinematics, glute inhibition, lower cross syndrome, altered motor control, scapular dyskinesis, joint centration, poor breathing, loss of form and force closure. You know, why have we wanted to know all this stuff? You know, because people like me, you know, this is from 2004. 
I wrote two papers, use of non-amplitude components of the EMG signal and identifying differences in, in function between low back injured and controls. You know, there's probably like 20 differences. You know, there's probably 40 now. And then here's another one, part, this was part one, it didn't get published in the same journal. Uh, kinematic differences, you know, how people move. People in pain, guess what? They move differently, you know, than people who aren't in pain. That was the conclusion. You know, 30 difference. And this was, what was this? 2004. Or what is it now? Like, after that, right? Like, 14 years later. So now we have like 100 of these. You know, and why have we wanted to know? You know, because the idea is we thought they were relevant. Right? That's what I thought. I mean, I was studying, um, like, the science of manipulation and that type of stuff. And we thought we could sort of predict uh, who would respond to back cracking. You know, because we, uh, where is it here? Oh, yeah, because of this paper. Uh, we did this paper. Surprisingly, you know, after you crack someone's back, there's variable changes uh, in how they move and how their muscles work. So we're trying to figure that stuff out. We're well-intentioned, you know, thinking, well, we can, if we can find out how people move differently, how their muscles work differently, maybe that can, you know, target our care to help them the most. Uh, but what I would argue, and I always do this as an example, come up with, if you can, some sort of biomechanical dysfunction or biomechanical research in the past 30 years that has actually really changed clinical practice.